Ladies and gentlemen, I see dead people. Or maybe a punchline from the film, the movies, The Sixth Sense for you, is die reality for me. As an emergency physician, I took care of thousands of people when they approached the line between life and death. Many I could rescue from dying, many I could bring back, but I stood next to more than 2,000 humans when they finally crossed the line between life and death and died. What I would like to do with you today is I walk with you the path from perfect well-being and life till death. And then we try to look a little bit beyond death. Don't be scared. I'll be with you all the time. <laughs> and I promise you, I will bring you back safely back to life. There are many illnesses and many injuries, but actually there are just four ways to die. Just four ways to leave this planet. What you see is the upright line, the line on the top of uh, the slide, is uh, the activity level. This is a perfectly normal activity level. This person is alive and kicking. And then an injury or illness sets in, and this person suddenly dies from one minute to the other. This may happen with a heart attack, and this may happen with a car crash. The second way of dying is someone is perfectly healthy again, and then a real bad illness sets in, and the health condition of this person rapidly and constantly deteriorates. This is the case with fast-progressing tumors, for example, with leukemia, with lung cancer, or with pancreatic cancer. The third way of dying is a person is once again perfectly healthy, and then another illness sets in, and the health deteriorates. Then our therapy starts, and we get this person a little bit better, but not to the baseline this person had before. And then the illness gets stronger again, and the health deteriorates. And once again, we try to um, help this person, to treat him, and he gets a little bit better. But once again, he will not reach his baseline, not even the baseline he had before the last deterioration. And so the circle repeats, and this person approaches death. This is the case, for example, with heart failure. This is the case with liver disease or with kidney diseases, and some, quite many, tumors. The fourth way of dying is different. Now the activity level is very low. This may mean that this person is immobile, is bedridden, is in a nursing home, maybe incontinent, and probably suffers from dementia. And this person slowly, slowly, slowly progresses towards death. Now, let's have a look. When we proceed a little bit closer to death, what are the signs and symptoms of those people who will die within two days? There's scientific evidence for that. And you see those signs which appear two days before death are very unspecific. At the present, we cannot predict correctly which person will die within the next two days or not, or will recover. We probably can in the future. We can do this not by one single symptom, but we can do predict it by a set of symptoms or even by a lab test. And I leave it up to you whether this is desirable or not. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of those people who allegedly die suddenly two hours before their death? And 75% of all those who allegedly die suddenly show signs and symptoms before their death. Only 25% of those who die suddenly do not show signs and symptoms before that. So that means that at the present, once again, we cannot predict who will die within the next two hours or not. Those are the ways to die. Now let's make a short survey. Let's make an opinion poll here, and I would like to see your hands. Now, who of you would like to die number one, way number one? I'm not surprised. I quite often see that. Who of you would like to day weigh number four? Not so many. Now, problem is, by far, most people die this way. By far. And the most rapidly progressing kind to die, way to die, is number four. Not even 10% of us will die number one. Not even 10% of us will die number one. So 
how we would like to die and how we will die is very different. Now, we all have different genders. We have different ages, we have different personalities, and we have different lives. There's only one thing we all have in common. We will die. For every one of us, the moment will come when our heart stops beating, when our lungs stop breathing, and when our brain activity ceases. We are now dead. Now, can we look what's happening to us beyond death? Can we have a glance what happens to us, what we will experience shortly after we have died? Actually, we can. We can look beyond death. Because of all those people we bring back successfully, we resuscitate successfully, 20% in the Western countries and more than 30% in the Eastern countries report something to us which we call near-death experiences. Those near-death experiences are reported all over the world. And those reports show striking similarities and reveal a pattern. This means death sets in, and those people who have a near-death experience, the first phase is there's a sudden change. And from one instant to the other, all pain is gone. All anxiety is gone. All fear is gone. All noises are gone. And there's just peace, calmness, and tranquility. Some report joy. And quite a number report something startling. There's an insight. The insight, I am dead now. This is what we call death. And this insight is there without any anxiety. The second phase of the near-death experiences is, again, a sudden change. And those people report that they are floating above themselves. They are floating above themselves, see them li themselves lying down on the stretcher, see us emergency physicians and emergency nurses trying everything to bring them back. They see from above what we are doing and they can listen what we say. The personality of the person who is gone is still the same, but they have left their body. We call this out-of-body experience. And what is annoying to us is that those people actually can describe what we did and can report what we said when they come back. We have no explanation for this. And I cannot offer any explanation to you because there's no brain activity at all. And we all feel to build a memory, there has to be at least a little bit of brain activity. But there is no brain activity. We do not have a scientific explanation for this. But we know this phenomenon is there. In the next phase, there's again a certain change. And in the third phase, those people who have a near-death experience describe that they are in a dark, confined space. There's complete blackness. And 98% to 99% of all those people who have a near-death experience describe this uh, being in a dark, confined space as comfortable, as pleasant, as warm, and soothing. But 1 to 2% of all those who have this near-death experience in this stage describe it as frightening. 1 to 2 say there are terrible noises, terrible smells, and terrible creatures. And what those 1 to 2% tell us resembles strongly the pictures by the medieval artist Hieronymus Bosch. And one might suggest that Hieronymus Bosch had a near-death experience or a vision of a near-death experience. But once again, this is only 1 to 2 percent. 98 to 99 percent describe it as pleasant. And what may be comforting is that a certain proportion of those 1 to 2 percent who describe it as unpleasant say it later turns into a pleasant event. Now, this unpleasant uh, near-death experiences in this third phase of the experience are not linked to any personality 
or to any religion. I used to say, um, if we could show that, let's say, Catholic people would have no uh, unpleasant uh, death experiences than Protestants had, then we would have billions for our research in the death events, but this is not the case. We don't have any predictor for this. Now comes the fourth stage. And the fourth stage means out of this complete blackness, a light begins to shine. This light is far away. This light is very warm, very bright, very attractive. And towards this light, out of the blackness, a tunnel is starting to form. And those people are strongly attracted towards this light and start to fly towards this light. And this light gets lighter and brighter and closer. And then comes the last phase of the near-death experience. Only 10% of those who have a near-death experience reach this last phase. In this last phase, once again, there's a certain change and there's a beautiful surrounding, beautiful colors, some say beautiful music, and a feeling of unconditional love. In this last phase, it may happen that those people who have a near-death experience have a flash forward through the whole life, starting from their birth over all major events in their life till their death. Not everyone has this, but some describe it. Some describe that they meet in this last phase relatives who have died before and are greeted by them. And some of them report, not all of them, but some of them report a being made out of light. And this being made out of light oozes out unconditional love to them. And they feel very, very warm and happy to be in this place. But half of those who are in this last stage of the uh, near-death experience say that they, at this point they decided to come back, mainly because they feel that there is a task in their life which is not fulfilled yet and has to be fulfilled. The other half tells that either the relative or the being out of light tells them to go back because there is something which has to be done still in life. Once again, I do not have any scientific explanation for that. We just know that it is there. All these phases, all these uh, experiences are well described and occur all over the world. Whilst this is happening, we emergency physicians and emergency nurses do everything we can to bring these people back. We do everything we can to bring these people back. Resuscitation by live people is easy. Call for help and push hard, push fast in the center of the chest. That's all. Do that until the ambulance is there. For us emergency physicians, resuscitation is a very complex and complicated task. So you have to know a lot to resuscitate people properly. At the present, we can bring back 7% percent of those we try to bring back, hopefully more in the future. Now comes something very interesting. Those people who we bring back and had a, a near-life experience reveal certain personality changes after that. And those we bring back and do not have had a near-death experiences do not show these personality <coughs> changes. The difference is very significant. The personality changes are people who have a near-death experience are, after this near-death experiences, more empathic, they are more social-oriented, they lose their interest, may lose their interest in materialistic values, they are more spiritual, not more religious, but more spiritual, and what is very, very interesting is they completely lose their fear of dying. 98 to 100% up to the different studies of all those who had a near-death experience completely lose their fear of dying. Now, how do I dare to talk to you about this topic? I'm not an expert in dying, I'm still alive. I'm not an expert in near I may be called an expert in bringing people back. This is my job, this is true for many years now. I never had a near-death experience of my own, but when I started 
to study near death experiences, what happened to me is that I found everything familiar. Everything, each phase, each twist, each turn sounded very familiar to me. So if I had known this all before, there might be an explanation for this. Science knows a phenomenon which is called empathic near-death event. Neopathic near-death event occurs if someone is there at the moment of the death of a very close, beloved uh, family member or uh, a relative. If someone is there at the moment of death of someone who is very close to him and dies, one might suggest that this person shares his near-death event experience with the person who sits next to him. Now, I told you at the beginning, I was with more than 2,000 humans when they crossed the line from life to death and died. And maybe over the years, at any point in time, those started to share their near-death experiences with me. And over the years, I developed exactly the same personality changes as those who had a near-death event, although I never had one of myself. This includes that I completely lost every fear of dying. I know it's nothing to be afraid of, not at all. And this, my dear friends, is a message I would like to share with you today. And maybe sometime, when we meet on the other side, then tell me whether I told you wrong today or right.